Hello and welcome to our deep dive interview with John from Turtle Wax. Before we get started, I'd like to take you through the event console on your screen. You'll see my video alongside the speaker information on the right. If you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A box. You can easily find tools using the menu bar at the bottom of the console. You can also check out the full agenda at any time by clicking on the Lynn Academy agenda image. At the end of the session, you'll be able to select your next topic or head back to the agenda to find out more. Now I'd like to welcome John Fawcett, e-commerce manager EMEA at Turtle Wax, who will be joined by Louise from Limworks to discuss the challenges and opportunities Turtle Wax has navigated through 2020, including preparations for online growth. Welcome, John. Great. So uh, if we could start um, by you talking us through your background and your experience at Turtle Wax. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, 10, 15 years really kind of in the e-commerce industry. I've worked uh, for a number of um, kind of exceptional people in my time, um, kind of starting for the, the company that was behind phones for you. So the, the old mobile phone retailer. Uh, I worked for the, the mobile phone and the, the accessory element of, uh, of that business and, and really kind of got my first kind of foray into e-commerce and, and what websites look like and how we merchandised for them and um, how we kind of looked at the commercials that stacked up and, and, and back in the kind of early 2000s, we were kind of doing contract mobile phones. So you had commissions, you had um, hardware costs, you had delivery costs, you had warehousing. And I got real kind of grew my appetite for business from, 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 from a reasonably early age. Um, and I kind of kind of transitioned through various roles in um, in that company that um, allowed me to to be exposed to to, uh, to Tesco, to eBuyer, to um, W H Smiths, and, uh, and and a look at kind of affinity partnerships and and, and honestly, it was a, a really good grounding for me in uh, in in kind of business and and everything that kind of went with it. And um, I, I then moved on to a, a company um, based in Daventry, who um, was the first kind of person I worked with that I. Kind of as, tr as a true mentor and um he uh, allowed me again still at a very very early kind of early age in my life to to be able to um to, to kind of explore what my capabilities were um but but really kind of started to cement some kind of real fundamentals of business um into me in terms of um acquisition of customers how we uh, approached account management how we looked at the kind of daily kind of business interaction of uh, of personnel employees how you built a team how you deal with technical people, how you deal with customer service people, and and um, I, I owe a lot to I owe a lot to him. Uh, I owe a lot to um, to that company and and everything they did for me. But um, kind of after that phase, I'd kind of grown out of um, with that and felt as though I needed to kind of go into the world myself. And uh, me and my wife set up um, our own business, and we and we had a, a really good six year stint at, at running our own e commerce platform, um, and that that kind of took some of the methodology that we worked in in, in kind of wholesale and, uh, and distribution and, and kind of flipped dropship on its head and we looked at kind of collecting multiple um, wholesalers um, building IT connectivity between them and allowing us to retail their items on our store on, on our marketplaces and sell to the customer bring those orders in and ship out and we accelerated that from my dad's garage in uh, what 2011 to 40,000 orders we were shipping by um, a month by the end of kind of July 2017 but um, and, and as we go into to some of the other experiences and and why I'm kind of the person I am today is um, we were the victims of our own success a little bit in that scenario and we we grew too quick for for what we had in place and um, the demise of that business was was short sharp and very severe and 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 it was yeah it was a it was a very kind of tough period for us but coming back to experience and and, and how you learn from those um that allowed me to transition into the role at turtle wax where i've now i was a business owner i've understood all aspects of uh, of e-commerce i think uh, reasonably well and allowed me to kind of start a project at turtle wax to help them transform their business digitally and um uh, and, and, and that project was um, a blessing in disguise in terms of me where I was personally in, 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 in my life at that time. We'd obviously just had a business that had collapsed and a very young son and my wife was uh, essentially in maternity at the time. And uh, it was a super, super, super challenging time. Um, but, um, but what Turtle Wax gave me was, uh, was the ability to, to kind of go in and, and, and look at 
what was required and deliver a project that um, allowed them to, to, to transform and, and, and pivot into the e-commerce space. And um, it's been a, a very, very exciting kind of two years. And um, I've learned a lot again, in, even in this very short period of time. Um, but it's, yeah, an excellent company and, um, and, and, and fundamentally kind of changed how I approach things in, in, uh, in e-commerce as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell, really. It's great to hear that story, just in terms of your background. Um, but you did mention that there was quite a transformation at Turtle Wax. Uh, so could you talk us through some of those changes and what the impact was on the growth of e-commerce at the business? Yeah, absolutely. So um, fundamentally, Turtle Wax is a, 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 as a brand is, is 75 years old. And um, if you look at that from, a, from a, a traditional business perspective, they're a manufacturer, they went to wholesalers, they went to distributors, and they went to retailers. And that has been the mainstay and still is obviously their, their kind of main route to market. Um, but when you kind of lift that layer away and you think about the practical elements of what that means for a business, that's very B2B, that's palletized distribution, that's invoice management, that's um, sales force on the road, that's everything that e-commerce isn't <laughs> to a large extent. And um, so the first part of the, uh, the, the project was really to kind of get into the weeds of the business and just understand what the capabilities were today and what we needed to get to in order to, um, to, to kind of deliver on what digital or direct to consumer kind of looks like. So the first couple of months was, was system and personnel led and, and really understand, okay, so if we wanted to go and sell a product on um, Amazon or we wanted to create a website, how do we service it and, and can we do that? And, and the short answer to that was no, we couldn't do that uh, to start with. So um, so what we looked at was um, the business um, processes that we had. And um, as I mentioned before, palletized distribution was something we were very good at. So the natural um, um, natural progression to that was to kind of look at Amazon FBA as a, uh, as a cost-effective, simple solution for us to be able to get world-class direct-to-consumer logistics and the ability for us to um, put some products onto a website, sell them, retail them, deal with the cash, deal with the customer service, deal with the, de um, the delivery of, of these items and um, get a sense for how um, disruptive that was going to be for Turtle Wax. And we think about what I said at the start well, about retailers and uh, its customer base being business to business and then you transform your brand and start selling direct to consumer the perception of that is that you're now starting to take away customers out of the spaces. And there are various challenges internally that you're faced with that. There are various challenges with um, customers that you're faced with that. But inherently what, what Turtle Wax was doing is, is if we looked at just the UK uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a snapshot of where we were, is uh, Halford's our biggest customer, our wholesalers. Yes, we were selling retail, but if we actually looked at what was going on online, we were only taking customers away from our competitors. We weren't taking customers away from people that were buying Turtle Wax. And this was incremental business. And that's kind of the approach that we um, we looked at, at kind of delivering that kind of message across everything that we were doing. So, um, so yeah, so, so fundamentally, the the, the the first part of kind of 2018 was, was around um, dipping our toe in the water and, and really kind of understanding what we what we could do and what we what we couldn't do, and then starting to put the infrastructure in place and starting to build that volume that as we kind of took and want to move the reliance away from kind of Amazon as such is what, what critical mass do we need to be able to take our, our warehouse from just palletized distribution and creating pick, pack and dispatch functions there? What couriers do we need? What customer service do we need? How, how are we going to merchandise um, products on these sites? And we've obviously got a lot of skill sets in the business that can, um, that can help with that, but you're starting to build a, a, a business or a channel within a, a much larger organization and that's that's kind of how we um, um, how we kind of set about it and and that that kind of formulated the the plan and the uh, the strategy that we wanted was um, how do we um, how do we set ourselves some targets what are the benchmarks that we're, we're going to hold ourselves to and um, and, and how we're going to be critical of, of the successes and failures that we uh, that we bring to, to the business and we set some targets we we tripled what we were expecting year one. We set um, some modest targets for, for year two, uh, and we blew that out of the water as well. And um, and that largely came from the fact that we we put that structure in place to start with to help us kind of get to those um, 
those positions and those benchmarks and um yeah that's 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 kind of how we've uh, kind of we've kind of delivered it and mm -hmm. 2020 in its own right is uh, is a <laughs> it's an unbelievable experience, but we are tenfold where we were year one, halfway through year three. So reasonably impressive starts, yeah. Yes, some great stuff that you can look back in, in retrospect. Um, it sounds like there's been a lot of change um, and you flagged some of the challenges that you had on the way. Uh, is there any other challenges internally that you faced uh, rolling out these processes other than the, the fear of that cannibalization? Yeah, so yeah, there were a little bit. Um, so we obviously touched on the kind of the operations um, part of that, and 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 there's also the 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 kind of the finance and the business. And, and so if you think about a hundred thousand transactions in a in a web store, that's a hundred thousand pieces of data, name, address, um, payment information. How is that reconciled? Or all of those things that um, that finance aren't particularly used to now becomes. Uh, a part of what we had to do. So there was there were some challenges around making sure that we have um, the proper uh, kind of data points to be able to reconcile all of that part. But but more fundamentally, I guess the challenge was around the, the cultural shift of what we were looking to do. And um, when we're talking direct to the consumer, um, that conversation was really a, uh, previously was direct to our customer and the customer and consumer in our business are, are, are two very distinct things. The customer is our, the businesses that we talk to and the consumer is the, essentially the end user of our products. And our culture was a, a, a customer conversation. So we were selling to the wholesaler, we were selling to the retailer and that was a very annualized um, uh, process. So we would go through our MPD or our new product development. We would create the new concepts of our items um, and we would then present them to the Walmarts of this world and to the Halfords of this world. And that was because they only change their products once a year. Well, we can change these things every day on our website if necessary. We can test and we can, um, um, we can bring back to the business opportunities that say, well, could this product's work, this product hasn't worked, or you think this could, we can do this type of thing or this type of thing. And, and breaking that kind of psyche, that culture, that, um, um, that kind of, business norm was not a ch it was eye-opening for, for for certain elements of the business but um was yeah it was a cultural shift that um well obviously we're still going through today but um um it's something that um i've i've particularly enjoyed um being able to kind of demonstrate that and and, and the flexibilities that we've got from an e-commerce perspective like that that's that that, that complement and help the rest of the business kind of um, um succeed in the areas that they're, they're kind of endeavoring to do so so yeah, some good, some good challenges, I guess, there. Yeah, a big job to do to engage yeah. those internal teams as well as uh, your, your, your external partners as well. Um, yeah. It would be great if you could give us a breakdown of all the teams that you do need to engage internally and the, the stakeholders that you involved. Yeah, so, um, so we take e-commerce as a, as a small channel and, 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 and just separate that uh, out of what we've, what we've got. We have an operations business, we have a marketing um, channel, uh, we have compliance, um, we have research and development, we have finance, uh, and then we have a kind of senior leadership team that, that, that spans both our US business and our, and our UK business. So in terms of kind of, kind of keeping the stakeholders um, on board and, 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 and just understanding what we're doing is, is, is around fundamentally project planning to a certain extent and, and, and just having a very clear understanding of what we're doing and when we're doing it and regular kind of um, um, timestamps with each of those to, to make sure that they're comfortable with the progress that we're making, understand the progress that we're making, but also for us to be so kind of self-critical, well, this hasn't worked, this worked, this didn't work, and, and these are the reasons why. And um, one of the, the parts that I was very keen on, on doing is not becoming siloed in, in what we do at e-commerce and not just, oh, it's all about this. There's, there's impacts on every part of the business that we're looking to engage. Operations have to change dramatically. Finance has to change dramatically. Marketing has to think about things in a, in, a, in a different way. And compliance has got now not just our safety data sheets and our, and our GDPR and are these products fit for purpose. We're now talking direct to the consumer at the, at the absolute point of purchase uh, or a point of engagement that, uh, that allows us to do, um, allows us to be, uh, uh, allows us to, um, We'll make sure that we're doing the exact things at the right time and we're displaying that these items are hazardous or they are um, uh, not fit for purpose for this type of uh, thing and we're, ha we're having to do things in a slightly different way so um, I, I was very keen on making sure that each and every stakeholder in the business had 
they're a chance to have their opinion, their guidance, share their thoughts. And it's not just about what I thought and, and what my team thought and, and where we were going, but it was a, a business decision that we obviously offered solutions and, and direction and, uh, and stuff, but we needed to lean on this, the skills of the business and, and the personnel that know way more than I ever will about uh, some of the things that they bring to the party um, and allowing them to, to kind of help kind of cultivate this uh, kind of transition for the business and, uh, and, and deal with it that way. It's really wonderful to hear that story, how you've gone from, uh, as you say, moving into this direct consumer space. And uh, you mentioned that 10X figure as well in terms of a result, which is great. Uh, but 2020 is a big year. There's been a lot of change for everyone. So uh, it'd be great to hear how COVID has impacted uh, this project. Yeah, well, um, well, uh, the soundbite really, I guess, is it's it's been an unbelievable year uh, for, for for many reasons. But if we just looked at the the, the kind of the practical business nature of transitioning um, office staff to remote working, not just at, uh, in our UK office in Liverpool, but the ninety people we've got um, globally um, that transition between different companies, different locations in the world, and that 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 in in absolute isolation of any of the kind of financial or any of the other routes has been a, a, a really big success story for the business and um, and I think everybody should kind of be really, really proud of kind of how we've been able to kind of just provide that continuity to the business and and um, if you kind of go back to kind of February, March time and you're thinking about can we get everybody to do their job in the environments that they are in at their home and all of the complications that are going to kind of come with family life, everybody been locked down for but for, for 24 hours, seven days a week, and so on and so forth, and the mental health impact of, of, of everything that goes with that, um, the business has been um, has been super supportive, um, really, really engaging, and, and really kind of brought, brought us together as a global community of people that uh, I think is really worth kind of mentioning at, uh, at this point. But, but that aside, and, and kind of back to e-commerce part, um, and if we just talk about that infrastructure for, for a split second again and, and one of the key things that we were we were super keen on building was the ability for us to be able to flex and flex from Amazon FBA to Amazon FS at FFP and, and be able to do our own dispatch and that came to fruition in March when FBA and Amazon locked down all of their warehouses to essentially medical and, and, and essential products only meant that car care was not one of those items so if we were an exclusively Amazon FBA business we would have no sales from March through to June whenever they open those um, FBA warehouses again. But we didn't. We had, we had the flexibility of being able to use our third-party logistics business uh, to be able to pick, pack, and dispatch. We have uh, a wonderful relationship with our kind of courier team and, uh, uh, and uh, provider um, GFS that allowed us to flex between different couriers depending on their capacities. And, um, and uh, we were able to deliver an unbelievable growth period. Um, we were talking um, not so long ago that we, we, we it was 10, 10, 10 12, 12, 12 times higher than what we were expecting in March, what we, what we delivered in terms of the requirement for our 3PL to, to, to kind of ship out um, products. And um, it was yeah, a fantastic period from a sales perspective for, for e-commerce. Um, but when we kind of look at like the retail results for, for some of our business and when we look at kind of true omni-channel partners, we look at the kind of the Walmarts of this world and um, uh, the Eurocar parts and these types of businesses that are both retail and, and have very strong um, web presence have, have, have continued to produce fantastic results. But the regions of uh, certainly Europe and, and the retailers where lockdown was long, severe. So we look at Spain, for example, they were in was military style kind of lockdown for a period of time where there was zero retail open and, and 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 there have been some struggles and we've obviously seen those but fundamentally across the entire business um financial results have been um fantastic um and um it's been fantastic to see that and um and, and fantastic to be a part of it really so um yeah a, a really good um kind of six months and and, and perhaps you can kind of look at COVID maybe accelerating some of the, the kind of trends and the thought processes that we have within the industry that e-commerce was kind of transitioning away, that it was going to become more and more prevalent in everybody days lives. And, and if you think back to just my, my nan ordering stuff off Amazon and um, my mum and dad becoming totally bought into the kind of home delivery of all of their food shopping and stuff. And, and those habits form over a 10 or 11 week period and, and then they become habits for life. And, and 
um, we we may have seen a, a, an acceleration of that um, kind of dominance of kind of e-commerce taking over certain aspects of kind of retail shopping, I guess. Yeah. That leads really nicely to my next question, uh, which is going to be about the acceleration of uh, e-commerce as, as a larger part of your business. Um, have you been able to really think about what that means for the next five, ten years and how you can ride the wave of, of that trend? Yeah, so um, good timing on the question. We put <laughs> we put our strategy um, to the business um, uh, back in August um, to really outline our, our plans for the next, in the next three years. I'll, I'll talk to obviously five and ten in, uh, in a little section, but Ultimately, what we're looking to, to, to achieve in that time, and if we can bear in mind that Turtle Wax is a $120, $130 million business turnover-wise, in the three years that we have planned now, we're looking to move e-commerce to be about 10% of that global business. Um, and as we kind of fast forward into kind of five or 10 years, 10 years maybe a little too far out to kind of predict, but we'll, we'll certainly be in the region of kind of 15 to 20% of that global business by kind of year five. And, and that's not just from our kind of UK and, and US operations, that's expansion into um, 20 plus countries over the next three years to, to really kind of cement what we're, what we're looking to do um, globally from an e-commerce perspective. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, a very interesting transition for, for Turtle Wax and, and, and what we're hoping is that that, that 15 to 20% is, is of, of an ever increasing higher number and it's not cannibalization, cannibalization of sales, but that, is a little uncertain at this particular moment in time as to kind of where, uh, what's going to happen with uh, a lot of retail partners that we deal with and a, and a lot of uh, kind of wholesalers and stuff. But yeah, fundamentally, that's the kind of direction of travel that we see things at the moment. And is there anything that you need to do to be ready to reach that 15% target and beyond? Yeah, so fundamentally, the, the transition of, uh, of e-commerce for us um, started about... Um, Kind of four or five years ago with the business from a marketing perspective identifying that the kind of traditional conventional forms of how we were kind of getting to people um, from a brand communication perspective was not working tv billboards posters all of that type of stuff was uh, yes you get thousands millions of eyeballs on those but when we think about when we we're looking to, to to kind of really get at the engaged consumer of our products then the digital space is, is, is a much better way of us being able to, to kind of get at those. And if we kind of look at the, um, the kind of Instagram element of um, kind of how we can kind of depict Turtle Wax and how we can kind of go into that kind of influencer space and really kind of start to kind of get people that have got followings and credibility that take wonderful shots and, and be able to kind of bring our products to life that kind of look at and engage the people that we want to sell to. And, and that transition from, from a digital marketing perspective, as I said, was like four or five, even a bit longer ago. And that, that kind of came with its, um, obviously with its challenges around um, kind of how you transition away from that kind of media buy spend to, to, to kind of moving it over to a more kind of social and digital mix. Um, but as, 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 as stand the test of time and is, is the kind of backbone of what we're looking to, to, to kind of do over the next kind of three to five years. But um, the other parts is around, and just, Infrastructure is a big, a big topic for me, certainly for the, the infancy of the project that we've got. And, and, and that is really just kind of cementing those. And, and the redeployment of all of our websites will happen um, the, last, the final quarter of this year. And, and that's really around taking away the brand site, if you will, so an online catalogue and really bringing e-commerce up into that space and, uh, and, and really delivering Turtle Wax to say, we are here as an e-commerce business now and we are looking to... Um, educate we're looking to uh, promote our products and how to use them but we're also looking to sell them and um and that that part is a is a big kind of redeployment of, of how we go to market um and then behind that is then is really kind of looking to support the omni-channel space as well so how do we produce the content that's required not just for our site but for our partners websites how do we get to get that information to them as quickly as possible and then how do we then look at the products that we sell and if we think about e-commerce versus retail product on shelf versus product in warehouse, we don't necessarily need the glitzy glamour bottle to be shout, uh, screaming and shouting like you do on a, uh, on, a, on a Tesco shelf or a Walmart shelf. We need something fundamentally functional. It delivers first time. It doesn't break in transit um, and, and all of those things. So we've got some transitions around how do we then create products suitable for the e-commerce channels and not just again for Turtle Wax, but for all of our partners that sell online is how do we overcome some of the challenges that they have 
we know returns rates, we understand breakage rates, we understand um, first time delivery rates, and they're not exclusive to Turtle Wax by any stretch. They're exclusive to everybody that um, operates e-commerce wise. So um, how do we take some of our internal learnings and, and be able to offer um, product solutions, packaging solutions, um, content solutions that allow, allow people to, to make Turtle Wax sing in their, on their websites and, uh, and, and deliver the experience that we want Turtle Wax to be for every person that uses it. It all sounds really exciting. Lots yeah. of changes happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any other challenges that you, you foresee just from what you've seen over the last six months and the, the transition that you've had in, in three years um, as you move into this kind of next stage of, of moving towards that e-commerce focus? Yeah, so I guess a little bit of adoption uh, and that's kind of internally and externally again is, is, is um, you're transitioning certain elements of the business that, that people may not be kind of comfortable with or they might not um, buy into, but it's, those challenges are, we, we try and approach from, a, from, a, from a, an analytical perspective. We, we try and project plan this as much as we can and, and to, to demonstrate the reasons why we're looking to do these things and, and what we predict the outcomes to be. Um, and I guess the biggest challenge for everything in this is the speed of that transition and, and, and are people comfortable with moving at, at sometimes certainly for a larger, more kind of established businesses, moving something within six months is, oh my God, moving something within a month is just unheard of. And, uh, and, and, and demonstrating that the speed doesn't mean that we haven't thought it through, or this doesn't mean that it's not the right decision to make. And, and, um, and, and, and breaking down some of those challenges is, 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 is I guess, some of the, the, the complexity of what we'll face over the kind of the next kind of, um, two years and, and three years or so and, and and back to kind of the external part of that is, is is some of the aspects of what we're looking to do in that kind of global deployment of what we're we're doing is to take the partnerships we have in these geographical extensions of of, of turtle wax and and bring to them uh, a, a, an approach and a, a and a methodology and, and a set of tools to help them or help us or help in, in combination to be able to deliver turtle wax regionally very quickly to customers and and, and some of them may not be expecting that and, and how we kind of deliver that and, and how we talk to them about that is, is, um, is, is going to be, again, kind of to that, back to that kind of transition and adoption piece that um, we, we just need to be sensitive with and, and make sure that we're, um, we're talking in the right language to the right people at the right time. Well, we're really looking forward to seeing how this journey evolves for you and, and hearing more about that progress. Um, but I'd love to shift gear a little bit and just ask yeah. what excites you most about this future world where e-commerce is, is playing a more prominent role. Yeah, so, and, 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 and this part of kind of e-commerce has really um, developed in me, uh, certainly in the last kind of like three years and certainly been within Turtle Wax. I've, I've worked for resellers and, and you don't really have that much association with the product that you're reselling. And whether it was a Samsung TV or a mobile phone and because we weren't making them and we weren't building a brand and we weren't um, doing all of those things, you kind of, you're a little bit detached from from, from that aspect of it, but kind of what Turtle Wax has kind of um, helped me understand is, is and, and, and really kind of get at is, is the customer and, and the, the consumer in that sense and building that, that community and that brand. And, and, it, and e-commerce, can be, you can get lost in data and you can get lost in purchase patterns and journeys, but it's, it's really around trying to get that kind of, have that conversation with that customer and really get to understand how they use the products, why they use our services, and then help that refine what we do. And um, that could be from, um, as I said, a, a different experience around how you navigate around a website, but it can also be the unboxing element of, of what they get when they get their Turtle Wax product. And um, when they've got it, does it work in every environment that they want it to? And getting that feedback real time back on, um, on Instagram stories or, um, we've got comments on YouTube videos or um, we've got um, people messages on Facebook to, to, to kind of understand, or can I, can I use this wax on a fiberglass boat? We, we haven't made the product for that. And to now know that the people want to understand whether that's a thing. And then we can develop content and develop interactions with people that really kind of allow us to, uh, to kind of um, express what these products can be used for and, and, and really help them um, with kind of tips and tricks and, uh, and really kind of piece of content. So um, yeah, from that aspect, it's, it's, it's just kind of taking all of those data points and just kind of being 
critical and obviously taking the success with what they are, but kind of being critical in what we do and, and, and utilizing that to, to kind of really refine not just the e-commerce element, but everything that we do um, across the business is, um, uh, I guess, the, it's, it's guess what excites me. And, and I guess that's a kind of a broader, uh, broader topic for me in, in, in that all aspects of business excite me. So uh, it's not just the kind of the e-commerce element of it as such, but that's kind of what I've focused in on at this point. Yeah, you've given great information about the, the macro trends that are driving this, uh, some of the, the social trends we're seeing. Um, do you have any other predictions for what's going to shape the future of e-commerce? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a super expensive question and, uh, and it, it, one that I, I like. And, and I guess I'd, I'd summarise it in, uh, in, in kind of one, one phrase that's got kind of five or six elements to it. And that'd be kind of personalisation. And, and that's not a new thing at all. Um, and if we think about personalization from a technical perspective and 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 the rigidness of a website right now and um that you have a essentially one size fits all you have a home page you have category pages and you have this kind of journey to get through a site and you can you can design up and you can uh, and you can change elements of that but fundamentally it's a it's a very structured beast and but moving towards more kind of a headless commerce where you you have the ability to um, transition a website to a particular customer or a particular purchase or customer acquisition journey that you think, okay, well, people from Facebook typically like to see this type of approach on a site. You can configure a website and a brand site to be 50 different things for 50 different types of people. And, and I think that kind of personalization of the storefront and, and being able to, to kind of talk to a consumer in a way that they want to be spoken to on a site, I think is, is the future of kind of where websites will kind of, kind of progress to over um, the next three, four, five years or so. Um, and, and again, back to the omni-channel aspect of that as well is, 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 is a really interesting one for me. And, and there's lots of anecdotal stuff of death of retail and death of this. And my perception of that is, well, flip retail on its head, make it an extension of your website rather than a cost associated with being in that. And if you think about um, utilizing your retail store as a local delivery point or a local conversational point of your website that you can join up your stock um, so a customer can take the Argos premises is a great example of that you go on and you can search for the next baby toy and you want to know if I can get it delivered to my house or I can go and pick it up on local Argos that's wonderful take that order that you've also placed on your mobile phone and utilize your store as the final mile collection point final mile delivery even same day delivery and then you start to break out from the norms and, and, and really kind of challenge e-commerce and the complications of e-commerce, which is other than the kind of Amazon at this moment in time, is same-day delivery is, is literally unheard of, um, certainly when you're kind of utilizing raw mails or the DPDs of this world. But um, flipping retail on its head and, and really allowing that to be an extension of what you do on your website and then taking the data points that you have and, and, and building that kind of personalized experience for, for people, whether they're in-store, whether on mobile, whether on uh, a device. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to see how that, um, that kind of pans out and, Walmart have got some really good uh, kind of initiatives in the US around how they're kind of doing curbside pickup and uh, and and stuff like that. So um, I'm really interested in that space um, and something kind of close to, to kind of my heart with um, kind of where we're looking to kind of transition a lot of what we're doing in um, in e-commerce for Turtle Wax is, is around packaging and delivery and sustainable packaging, shippable, and dare I say reusable packaging and really kind of starting to break down a lot of that single-use plastic, a lot of that single-use uh, of our, our, our trigger sprays and, and really develop that to um, allow customers to um, keep hold of the initial purchase. And then how do we get product into that initial bottle? How do we refill it? How do we get them items that, are, um, um, that can utilize that same uh, initial kind of delivery of the item uh, and we refill it? And, and, and what happens with that is it's, it then starts to really kind of generate other revenue opportunities for you so you could can you create subscription services around refilling that bottle for a customer can you create um uh like i said reusable packaging or um, um sustainable packaging which means you aren't contributing so much to, to kind of some of the climate issues that we talk about and I'm, I'm really interested to see how um that kind of takes off and we obviously have uh, we all read a lot around kind of drone delivery and whether that's ever going to be something that takes off excuse the pun but maybe that lends itself a bit more to the kind of the grid network in the US and, and, and how their kind of infrastructure is set up. But um, yeah, that 
absolutely is um, is something that we need to kind of consider. Um, electric vehicles, how does that how does that change what we're sorry, my dogs are barking in the background. Um, how does that change how we uh, are able to deliver to our customers and how we're um, we're able to um, um, cost out our, our delivery options and such. And then the final two are, are really around, and this is, I guess, where we're kind of moving into a different element of everything that we're kind of doing. So we've got 8 billion devices, it's reported, that will be in market by 2023 that will all be integrated with voice. And some of the things that we're kind of looking at exploring right now around the Alexa skills and kind of having that conversation around how to do this, how do I wax my car, how do I wash my windows, how do I do all of these things? And, and they are programmatic kind of conversations that we can kind of answer a question. Um, and as we kind of move through the next couple of years or so is how do we then start to integrate e-commerce into, um, um, into, that, into that voice capability? How do people want to purchase? Do they want to purchase? Uh, and how does that lend itself to, to, to kind of how we kind of need to transition website? How do they want to search for products? Does that change any of the SEO perspective of how we kind of annotate pages and, 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 and write up stuff? So that's, a, that's an interesting space too. And then and, and finally, it's kind of AI and, and outside of the kind of digital marketing mix and, and how that can kind of help analyze data and, um, and, and potentially help with the acquisition of customers is bring that on site and then how do we look at kind of personalizing um, kind of interactions for customers and, and if we bring that back to Turtle Wax for a second is um, a customer wants to um, fix up a scratch or they want to fix up um, a, an issue with the paintwork on the car well can we go through a series of, of questions that an AI can interpret and then start to recommend the right product at the right time and, and, and stuff like that that we can kind of start to generate a personalized um, interaction on the site that gets to the customer to get to the right product at the right time um, and, and helps them understand why that that is the right product for them. And that kind of goes hand in hand with kind of got chatbots and, and, and the advancements of that, but can you bring that to a more visual aspect in, um, in, in, in um, kind of product selection uh, than the, the kind of pop-up experience that you get with, with chatbots? And so I guess those are, those are kind of where I see things kind of moving over and the things that I'm interested in over the next, um, over the next few years or so. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're blessed with um, a, a technology industry that is, is ever changing, ever evolving, and um, um, it's really exciting. Uh, and I think um, the next few years or so, we're going to accelerate even quicker with just the requirements of, of customers and, and a kind of post-COVID world and, and how much people have kind of transitioned in their behaviour as to, as to how they want to kind of deal with websites, go to shops and, uh, and ultimately consume products. So, yeah. That's yeah, it'd be interesting I mean. seeing which of yeah. uh, the brands can rise to those challenges, particularly with so many hot topics that you mentioned. Uh, but yeah. it was really great to hear about Turtle Wax's journey and some of your own insights about the changes within the e-commerce business. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. It was yeah, great no to chat to you today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John and Louise. What a great insight into a very successful e-commerce strategy. Make sure you check out the agenda for an overview of what we have coming up or jump straight into your next session by clicking on one of our three channel options. See you soon.